It is my honor to introduce our class day speaker, Mr. Trevor Noah. Originally from South Africa and a current resident of New York City, Trevor Noah is one of the most successful comedians in the world. In just the past year, his Emmy award-winning TV show, The Daily Show with Trevor Noah, received six Emmy nominations. Mr. Noah has also written, produced, and starred in 11 comedy specials. Many in our class consider him to be one of the most astute cultural critics of our time, and they have found his comedy as an entryway into deeper conversation. In April of 2018, Mr. Noah launched the Trevor Noah Foundation, a development initiative that empowers youth with access to high quality education. Through a partnership with Microsoft, the foundation is able to provide under-resourced schools with technology as a tool to enhance the learning experience and increase digital literacy beyond the classroom. We are thrilled to have Mr. Noah as our class day speaker because of his talent for bringing joy during this year's unprecedented times and to talk about challenging subjects with humor. He has inspired us with his ability to transcend boundaries and navigate the world with grace, kindness, and a commitment to finding common ground. Now, I would like to present Mr. Trevor Noah in conversation with our class day chairs, Kamia, Michael, and Morgan. Welcome in, Mr. Noah. It's so good to see you. My name's Morgan. What's going on, Morgan? How are you doing? Doing well. Hi, Mr. Noah. I'm Kamia. It's so nice to meet you. Hi, Kamia. How are you doing? Pleasure to meet Pretty you. Pretty good. Hi, Mr. Noah. I'm Michael. Good, good to meet you, Michael. You've got a really cool uh, picture in like the, in the, in the, um, what is it? The class day thing. You guys have like a little, like a little superhero compilation oh. going on there. I like it. I appreciate it. It is such a pleasure to welcome you in. Uh, so we have a couple of questions on behalf of our peers that we know that just they're just so eager to hear from you. And so the first question is, you know, when did it hit that, you know, comedy, like this is this is my calling, this is what I'm good at. But when did that moment hit for you and how might we seek that moment out for ourselves? It was the first time somebody paid me, Morgan. That's that's when the moment was. Um, no, I'm joking. The, the The first moment when I knew it was a calling was instinctively when I made people laugh for the first time. So, you know, in school, I'd always been like the class clown. I was never the most popular kid, but I made everybody laugh. I mean, whether it was the bullies, whether it was the jocks, whether it was the nerds, whether it was, I just knew how to make people laugh. I knew how to get into their worlds. I would make teachers laugh as well. It's not like I was, I was an asshole to, to my, my teachers. You know, they'd never be like, Trevor misbehaves. They would always just say like, he just, you know, he likes making people laugh too much. Sometimes he needs to calm down. and. Um, and this would follow me everywhere in life. You know, I would, I would, I would tell jokes at, at parties. I would, you know, whenever there was a group of people gathered around, I would, I would try and tell funny stories. And, and over time, I came to realize that this, this was something I wish I could do. But you must remember in South Africa, we didn't have a comedy scene at that time, you know, because of apartheid, free speech was inhibited. And so it's not like we ever had a comedy thing. So I never dreamed of being a comedian, but I think that's when the calling hit me. And, um, and so, yeah, for the first few months of my comedy career, I did it for free. I loved it. Um, and it only became a, a career when somebody paid me for the first time. Then I was like, oh, wow, I can actually try and do what I love for, for, for a living. And, and that, um, as they say, the rest is history. Um, Mr. Nora, how do you navigate belongingness? As an international student, I'm constantly thinking about what home means. You grew up in South Africa and then moved to the U.S. to pursue comedy. So do you ever find yourself feeling like home is in multiple places and nowhere at the same time? Or is it something completely different for you? You know what I've come to realize, uh, Kamya, is I've come to realize that home for me could be different for everyone, but home for me is where my people are. And what I've come to learn is my people can be anywhere. You know, so I, I have a close knit group of friends who I've grown up with, who I've met over the years in my life, whether it's in comedy or in, in, in just general life. And, 
And those people have become like the core of who I am as a person. They remind me of who I am. Um, they make me enjoy life with them. We, we, we share stories and we build together. And so for me, those people have become home. And so when I think of South Africa, I think of that as my home. But then when I think of New York, I think of New York as my home. You know, I think of, of, of the joy that I have when I'm out here. I think of, um, you know, California at some point. Pasadena was my home. So, so for myself, I, I, yeah, I've come to realize that as long as I have the people, any place feels like home. And in terms of belonging, it is the people who make you feel like you belong or you don't. It's not the place. And so if you can find a group of people who, who you relate to, who, who make you aspire to be more, who challenge you, who help you enjoy life and, you know, help you through the tough times as well, then I think you'll find a sense of belonging no matter where you are. Mr. Noah, I want to get a little bit more into your work. In your mind, what role does comedy play in popular culture right now? So what are you thinking about when you create content for your specials or for The Daily Show? Well, Michael, the one thing about comedy now is that it's so mainstream and it's so big that I don't think it has a role. I think it can play multiple roles, you know? So asking what role does comedy play is like saying, what role does tech play? Or what role does music play? Or what role, you know, I think at, there was a time when comedy was so niche that maybe it played a role, but I think, I think now it plays many roles. The most important one for me, I define my rules for comedy and I go, number one, the first rule for me is to make people feel better. That's what I'm trying to do. You know, I want you to laugh. When you come to my show, when you watch my TV show, whatever you do, I want you to leave feeling a little bit better than when you came in. And that's what I, because I love that. I love going to comedy shows where I laugh and I enjoy myself and I go like, man, that was fun. And then I'm laughing on the way home and I'm trying to tell the jokes to my friends the next day. That's, that for me is what I'm looking for. And that's what I try and give to an audience. I think comedy on a, on a, on a, on a larger scale for me is, is also about speaking truth. You know, um, comedy for me has always been that place where it's like we can talk about the uncomfortable truths. You know, we can talk about racism while laughing with people. We, we can talk about uh, misogyny while laughing with people. We can talk about some of the more uncomfortable things in society and hopefully poke holes and reveal some of the light that comes through those holes while using comedy to, 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 I guess, lessen the burden that the audience is feeling. So instead of it just being a lecture about like, oh, this is why racism is bad, it's using comedy in such a way where somebody's sitting in the audience and they're like, man, I never thought of it like that. Yeah, actually, racism is pretty stupid. I got to think about these things. I got to figure that out. Oh, yeah, actually, why do we have toxic masculinity as men? This is holding us back. Maybe we should try and figure. But it's like, how do you figure out how to play with that and tell the truth? And so for me, comedy is oftentimes uh, a tool that I will use to subvert what society has accepted as normal or the standard or, or you know, or the status quo, because that's oftentimes what happens in society is we just accept something as being normal. And then at some point, you know, as a comedian, you go like, guys, this is, this is not normal. You realize that, right? This is not actually normal. We've just done it for so long. And so I, I enjoy those aspects of comedy. And I think that's, that's the role that comedy fills in my life and what I try to do with it in the world. So thinking of that subversion and that discomfort, what has been your greatest lesson around taking risks? What has been my greatest lesson in taking risk? That's interesting. I think I would split that lesson into two. Number one, not all risks are worth taking. And what I mean by that is sometimes I understand that the risk may not even be to myself, but it may be to the subject of the comedy or the unintended consequences of the comedy that I'm saying. And so what I realize is I go, ah, if I'm trying to tell this joke, and it may come off the wrong way. Let me try and spend more time not telling it and figuring out how to clean up the, the, the you know, what, what I like to call the targets of the joke and, and then minimize the risk, if I can call it that. Because, you know, I can't control how people feel about jokes. Everyone can be offended about anything. I, I, don't, I don't believe in like going, oh, if you're offended, oh, I'm sorry. No, you can be offended by anything I say. And if you are offended, I didn't intend to offend you. And because offense is taken, I have no control over your offense. Uh, what I do know is, 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 is comedy, not just professional comedy, but even between human beings, interpersonal comedy is all contextual. You know, you can say something, Morgan, to your friends that a stranger could never say to you because you have the context of your friendship. You know, Michael, you can say the same thing to your friends that nobody can say. And the same thing with you, Kamya. You can say things. These are things that you have because you have context. 
And so when I look at the risk, I first look at the context and then I think about mitigating that risk. And so I go, who are we and what are we talking about? Unfortunately, these days, especially with comedy and, and, and I think with social media as well, a lot of the time context gets thrown into the wind because you can be having a conversation with one person and social media is weird because back in the day, I would be talking to Kamya, just me and you, Kamya, and I'll be talking to you. And let's say we've been best friends for 10 years and I'll tell you a joke about India and then you'll tell me a joke about South Africa and we laugh. Now we do that on social media and then somebody who doesn't know us goes, how dare you say that about India? How dare you say that about South Africa? And all of a sudden the context of our conversation has been lost. And so when I look at the risk, I try and mitigate as much as I can that happening because my intention is not to, I don't have time to offend people. I'm not even trying to, I don't, I don't benefit anything from that. So I try and mitigate that risk, but at the same time, not at the expense of speaking my truth. Thank you so much. Um, something that, you know, we've been thinking about is traveling during the pandemic. And in Afraid of the Dark, you said that traveling is the antidote to ignorance. For those of us who missed the typical college experience because of the pandemic, could you talk more about how travel has influenced your own perspectives? Wow. Travel has not just influenced, it's shaped my perspective. You know, travel for me is, is, is a humbling experience if you do it because it will show you that the world is bigger than your world. It'll also show you that every idea you have that you accept as dogma is in fact just an idea. And so when you travel, you start to realize that most of the rules we learn as human beings are just societal structural ideas that have been imparted on us by our parents or our forefathers. But when you go somewhere else, they're like, no, we, we just don't do that. You know, and, and I think that that's humbling. And I think it's also informative because it tells you and it teaches you that the way you think the world is, isn't. It's just the way your world is. And, and so whether it's learning that somewhere out there, people are just like, nah, English? Who gives a damn about English? And you're like, oh, but English. And they're like, no, we don't care. And you're like, but how do you do things? And they're like, yeah, we don't care. We speak other languages. That's humbling. You know, you go to another place where they, they go like, oh, this is, this is what we do. This is how we eat. We eat with our hands. Or, or this is how we speak. Or this is how we laugh. Or this is how we dance. Or this is how we communicate with everything. And I think that, that that's a humbling experience. That's why, that's why I truly enjoy it, because I think it, it gives you a sense of, of understanding that everybody is generally coming from a perspective in the world that they think is correct because they've learned it. But in fact, there is no one correct way to do anything, you know, unless it's science. Everything else, we've just applied with a veneer of the way it's supposed to be. So we're coming a little bit close to the end here. I think we have time for one more question. And then the 2021 class officers want to induct you as a honorary member of our class. So this past year has been, you know, it's been incredibly stressful and also transformative in both good and bad ways for everybody. So I want to ask you, looking forward, what is your greatest hope and your biggest fear for the year that follows? My greatest hope is that we will use this time, which is arguably one of the worst periods the world has been in, in recent history, to, to try and transform how we do things. You know, let's relook everything the way we've been forced to relook everything. Let's relook work. Do people need to be in the office five days a week? I think we've realized that they don't need to be. If possible, people can work from home when they need to. It can be better for your mental health. It can be better for traffic on the roads. It can be better for parents who need to stay home and look after their kids when they're sick. It could be better for everybody in society. We realize now that it's possible. I hope that in the future, we apply these lessons. I hope that in the future, we come to realize that just like everybody who was forced to stay home or forced to, to, to leave work or forced to, to not participate in society, that once coronavirus is gone, there is still a subset of society that has permanent coronavirus. People don't just not have jobs because they don't want to have jobs. You know, most people are out of work. Most people cannot be integrated into the workforce. Most people are struggling. Most people are starving. This is happening despite coronavirus. Coronavirus just made it, I guess, a more mainstream thing. And I hope that after this, we have a little more compassion and going like, oh, wow, you're unemployed. I know what it's like to be unemployed because coronavirus made me unemployed. Oh, wow. 
you 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 haven't been this or you you're sick or you're disabled or you I understand these things a little bit more because temporarily I experienced these same statuses. I hope that we move forward with a certain sense of compassion. What are my fears going forward? My fears, especially for America, is that coronavirus will merely become a blip on the radar where people learn nothing from it. My fear is that it'll, it'll become a politicized idea in people's minds where somehow the way so many things have in America because of social media and just the way information gets warped, it'll become another conspiracy theory. It'll become another, you know, like, oh, who did coronavirus? Who did 9-11? It, it just becomes a game. And my fear is that instead of looking at this as a moment in time when humanity itself was tested and people were forced to think together and move together and be together, it will actually be seen as just another point of fragmentation where people can go off in their different directions and believe whatever they wanna believe. And I fear that many people will learn nothing from this experience. That's my fear. Thank you so much. Yes, thank you, Mr. Nella. No, thank, thank you. you, thank you all. It was a pleasure. Thank you so much, Mr. Nella, for taking the time to join our graduating class on this special day. Before we officially induct you into our class, I would like to start with introductions from our class officers. My name is Emma and I'm the senior class president. I'm studying in the School of Public and International Affairs and I'm from Tenafly, New Jersey. Hi, I'm Sanjana. I'm the senior class vice president. I'm a sociology major and also from New Jersey. Hi, I'm Kavya. I am the senior class treasurer. I'm from Miami, Florida, and I'm studying in the School of Public and International Affairs. Hi, my name is Arielle. I'm the 2021 class secretary. I'm a psychology major with a certificate in gender and sexuality studies, and I'm from Cherry Hill, New Jersey. Hello, I'm Phoebe. I'm the 2021 class social chair. I study civil and environmental engineering, and I'm from Philadelphia. And so every year we select honorary class members to join in our graduation celebrations. Mr. Noah, we're absolutely thrilled to welcome you to the great class of 2021. And I'd like to take a moment to read what is written on the certificate that we're presenting to you as part of your official induction into our class. So the Princeton University class of 2021 welcomes Trevor Noah into its ranks for his singular talent of bringing joy during the unprecedented times of this past year. Mr. Noah captivates and inspires our generation through wit and incisive analysis of the salient socioeconomic and cultural issues of our world today. He is guided by a moral compass that seeks equity and justice for all people, and in doing so demonstrates to us the power of giving voices to one's own values. Mr. Noah has inspired us with his ability to transcend boundaries and navigate the world with grace, kindness, and a commitment to finding common ground. We are honored and grateful to invite him into our cohort. And so as a member of the great class of 2021, you will receive the alumni magazine and we're honored to invite you to all of our class reunions in the future. Um, Professor Eddie Glaude, who has been a guest on your show was kind enough to send along some signed books for you to add to your collection. And finally, we'd like to present you with some Princeton clothing. clothing. I see that you're already wearing your Princeton hoodie and we're hoping that you'll add some more orange into your wardrobe. Thank you again for your remarks and welcome to the Princeton class of 2021. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you, thank you so much. Thank you very much. I will now introduce myself. Hi, I'm, I'm Trevor Noah. I am uh, the, part of the honorary class of 2021 and um, I've been studying uh, hoodie management. Um, I, have a, I have a degree in hoodie management. My major has been sweatpants and general hoodie Zoom couture. And so that is what I've been studying this year. And I just want to say thank you to everybody. I appreciate you so much. And uh, we did it, guys. We did it. We graduated. We did it. Thanks, everybody. I really appreciate you guys, man. This has been so much fun. And I really hope you guys go out and change the world. Don't, don't let it be the same way it was before you came into it. Thank you, everybody.